I wanted to introduce uh, our guest tonight and thank everybody for, for jumping on. Um, the speaker series was set up to create, if we want to call subject matter experts with our community and uh, part of the, the, um, the opportunity here is both connection to specific rowing opportunities, as well as just making our community connected as we get through COVID. Um, certainly taking a toll on our community. And these, these events are literally a chance for us to see each other, um, recall sort of our shared interests and bonds, and really bridge our feelings and connections around learning and around exploration of our, um, just of our amazing community, right? So um, uh, being on the water and vaccinated and being in the spring, warmth, you know, might feel like it's really far away for many of us, but here's to hoping this talk tonight will shorten the runway for um, uh, our launch from winter into sort of landing back at CRI in April or May. So just to give you a quick pre preamble of Justin, um, Justin's, J Justin's day job is a uh, co-founder and uh, chief coach at Hydro. Uh, and I'll let Justin say as much as he wants about that, but he's coaching some of the most amazing athletes that are presenting rowing outside of the rowing community to uh, the world at large. To give you a sense of the scope of the reach of the athletes that Justin is coaching, you know, US Rowing's annual membership is around 100,000, give or take, you know, five or 10 here. In America every day, over 2 million people take rowing strokes. Uh, and so as a model for what rowing can be, it's not just rowing on the water, but it's really training and success through all of the mod modalities that rowing can bring. Um, Justin, you're gonna maybe blush, maybe not, who knows, but um, uh, Justin is a six time NCAA uh, coach uh, who has coached champion crews six times to the NCAA championships. He's a U.S. junior national team coach. Um, he's certainly one of the most respected and influential voices in the sport of rowing. Um, uh, he spans uh, Division Three, Division One. He's coached the, the national team, as I mentioned. And his perspective really comes from both being a high-performing athlete as well as a coach. And tonight, what we're going to hear from Justin about is really sort of an interesting take on uh, um, how to train uh, to those who are more self-directed. You know, I'll use that. I'm a self-directed person who trains, uh, but I think um, part of the part of the opportunity here is to is to get a voice from someone who has been in the sport for a long time, um, but create a dialogue and create some insight around different modalities and from a creative thinker about rowing and the applications of lessons learned through his experience um, to our community. And I see a lot of logbook scholars. I see, you know, this is sort of focused on a group of, of, of our community, which really focus, really is directed towards what I call sort of the achy, achy older rowers. And I think um, one thing that we avoid as older rowers is the opportunity to really train at a high level and I think the um, voice that Justin will bring to tonight's discussion is really um, an interesting, compelling, and um, I hope for you, uh, informative one. So um, without further ado, Justin, uh, take it away. Thank you, uh, Ted. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Can I get a thumbs up if you guys can hear? Oh, oh great. You're good. Um, You're good. Uh, Ted, you rescued me from my technical issues and, um, and, and uh, Bodhi, I, it is bringing me great pleasure to sit there and look at your skull cap. That is, um, I, I've been reading a little bit about um, uh, COVID fashion and what they're say saying is that um, the only thing that matters is kind of collarbones up and um, very, very, very uh, bold statements that you can make on your screen. So I love the bold statement you're making. Um, I selfishly, I volunteered to do this. And, and what I mean by that is I am socially starved. I, um, 
need to talk to people and I want to interact with people and I want to see people's mouths move and I want to have conversations with people I haven't met before. And um, we were kind of sitting here and talking about, well, we had no idea if anybody would even show up for this call because truthfully, two days ago, there were no questions in the chat um, for, for me <laughs> to kind of research and look at. But um, I'm very interested in having a conversation with you guys about what you're interested in, um, not sitting there and lecturing you about something that I find interesting. So I would rather people ask questions um, then me just kind of lean into this is what I think about training. Um, and so with that, if anybody has a burning question that they want to open with, I would love, I would love to hear it. I'm going to open it up just because we have a, we have a shy audience that'll open up once we get, get growing. I Good. see Lee Warren Good. and a couple other people that'll uh, share their perspective, but so as a master's rower, one of the um, one of the baselines that you bring, one of the one of the base one of the one of the shifts, one of the paradigms that you bring is that a lot of people on this call have been uh, trained, if you will, to think about the idea that volume is the baseline for all training. And as a master's rower. I remember the volume I did as a younger person, but when you're talking about asking me to do the volumes that I think I should do in order to become more fit, one of the differences between that modality and yours is that you actually think that people should, should train differently. Yep. So, so what, is the, what is your approach that's different from I should do 50% of my training uh, at steady state, I should do 25% of it at AT, and then I should do some level of speed and strength work. You have a very different take yeah. on, on training, yeah. even for recreational master's rowers. So well, share a little bit about that. What was really fun um, when I was in graduate school, um, Williams College required me to have a master's degree in order to continue to work there. And um, after exploring the potential for a number of master's degrees, I graduated in 1990. So the, the thing to do in the 90s was go get an MBA. And when I was coaching at Yale, they were willing to pay for my graduate school. So I started pursuing my MBA while I was at Yale. And managerial accounting and finance was not for me. I just struggled in, I struggled to care about those classes. Um, and later on, when I moved to Williams, I got a, a graduate degree in coaching. And within that degree, I wrote effective training for the time starved athlete. And, um, how many people here, I only, I, I don't have a complete full screen, but I have a fairly, how many, how many people here consider time to be one of their most valuable resources? If you don't mind raising your hand. Yep. Yep. So we're, we're, and, and when we're looking at that, the idea of uh, volume. So let, let me just jump back. When the wall fell, a, um, and all of East Germany or all of Eastern Europe was able to come to America. There were so many coaches and so many people that ran sport institutes that came over, Hartmut Buschbacher, Chris Korzanowski, all of those people went to find a better life in America. And the everything in rowing was developed from that period of time and those training philosophies, which was what's called the periodized pyramid. Does there, so, so the idea that, look, the bigger I build my base, the higher my peak is going to be able to be. Because if you've ever built a sand castle and you've poured sand, you see that it just spreads out and spreads out and spreads out. So the wider the base of your sand castle, the higher that peak can be. And it, it's a very interesting theory. So you, you're supposed to do hundreds and thousands of hours in this base level and then build on top of that with your AT and then go to your, and, and then go to your race pace. 
But what's happening now in the sports of track and field and in the sports of um, swimming is that they realize that the only thing that matters is that you know the speed of your event and that you, and that you can go the speed of your event. And one of the things that's really interesting is if you've ever been an athlete like myself, who was really interested in succeeding on the national stage, I was one of those guys who, when they were testing us, um, I would be on the first page for US rowing testing for hour long tests back way back when, when we did hour long tests. And then I would be on the first page still, but further down when we would do 6,000 meter tests. And I wouldn't be on the first page at all when we would do 2,000 meter tests. And what did we race? 2,000 meters. Yeah, that's, and, and so here's the issue. As good as, as phenomenal as I could be with my hour, it didn't matter because that wasn't the pace we needed to go. So it didn't take me long to realize that genetically I was not built for 2,000 meters. Um, and so I started to explore some events that I thought maybe I could do with. And after rowing, I went to marathoning and that was three hours. And I was pretty good at that, but still not phenomenal. So then we stretched it out to about 10 or 11 hours with Ironman distance triathlon. And I was even better at that, but still not, not where the top of the world was. So I think that my go-to, like my great spot for my um, persistence and willingness to suffer would be five-day adventure racing or something like that, except I don't like being cold and hungry that much. So, um, so I'm not sure that it is the right event for me. But when we think about it, what's so interesting is how frequently do you go the speed required to win your event? And, and another thing that's really interesting, when I get new young athletes that say, I want to train for the single, I want to be uh, the U.S. national team single, I said, well, how fast do you need to go in the single? And they say, I, I don't know. I don't know how fast I need to go in the single. I just know I need to train a lot. I need to do a lot of volume. I need, to, I need to work harder than everybody else because that's the American thing. The American thing is to show up and outwork everybody so that you get the opportunity that you deserve. And um, what swimming and track and field are now finding is that speed kills. That speed is the thing. Going fast and understanding how to go fast is the critical feature of being able to succeed in your event. So in the sports of swimming, um, there are some coaches that go race pace every day at different volumes. And um, I don't necessarily recommend it unless you really know how to balance your rest. But, um, but in track and field, they're saying understanding how to go fast is absolutely critical. And in our sport, which is incredibly technically demanding, I really like looking at swimming because swimming takes place in water like our sport does. It's whole body like our sport is, and it is incredibly technically demanding like our sport is. And one of the interesting things is in our sport is if you row well at this speed and intensity, you will likely row well at every speed and intensity that happens below that. But if you row well at this speed and intensity, there is no guarantee that you're going to row this well at higher speeds and higher intensities. Does that make sense to folks when I say that? Yeah. And so, I think one of the things that's interesting for our group is that given the number of world championships that this group represents, um, part of what we are looking for is I, I, I love, and I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think there are a couple it. of key things for what we're trying to, to learn here is that, you know, we are, we are time starved at some level, you know, we only yep. have 90 minutes or an hour and a, or, you know, two hours. And, and you brought up a couple of things I think are really effective for potentially how our sculling community and our, our adults might change the way they train. So you're suggesting, for instance, that the paradigm of thinking that going out and rowing steady state for 90 minutes five out of five days a week 
and then come race day, we might do a little speed work or, you know, like everybody wants to avoid the pain. But what would you suggest for someone who just wants to get a little bit more out of the rowing experience? Because I think, I think one of the things that people who are, um, who may not be training at the elite level and say, okay, that's cool, Justin, that's great for elite athletes, but what about me? Part of what I hear you saying is actually it would be helpful for our community to think about going out for 60 minutes and trying to row at their race pace the to elite. actually get the same amount of benefit as a 90 minute or a two hour row. Is that what you're saying? So part of the reason that the elite athletes do, do so much volume is because as we've gotten into this um, arms race of more, 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 um, your body's ability to recover is absol absolutely the limiting factor. The interesting things is that most of the training programs that came out of Eastern Europe from the 1980s, um, if everybody thinks about the German swimmers from the 1970s, that was an incredibly heavy drug use time, which allowed accelerated recoveries. And now we're, we're talking about looking at a group of people that are saying, how do I get fast? Um, when I'm, when I'm not, when I'm not doing any of these performance enhancing things, or maybe I only get to work out once a day. So let me begin going back to the, the effective training for a time starved athlete. Let's just pretend that you have a race for six weeks from now, and you're only going to work. You're only your time only allows you to work out one time per week. What do you think you should do if you're only working out one time per week, and you have a race in six weeks? I'm going to check the chat. Come on, people. Somebody other what than what would you do? Come on, what? practice Somebody races. Else. Practice your races. Yeah. <laughs> Or, or let me, let's say, um, because races are very painful um, and there are ways to practice going the speed you need to go without encountering that much pain. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, uh, is it Rowena who just said that? It was Catherine. Catherine, got it. Um, so, 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 Let's, let's say that I would encourage people to practice going the speed that they would need to go in their race because technically, neurologically, um, and, and, and the neuromuscular patterns that we develop are incredibly time specific. To, to pull from swimming, when Katie Ledecky is practicing going at Olympic winning speed, her body is planing out of the water at a height that it's not at when she's going slowly and doing lots of long distance miles. So the water interacts with her fingers at the entry, um, the speed at which she bends her wrist and bends her elbows to, to get what's called the catch and swimming, that all changes when she's at her race pace versus when she's going long, slow distance. I would, I would, yes. sorry, I would, I would add one thing that's even more. Think about the idea of going for a bike ride, and pedaling at fifty percent of the speed that you pedal. Yep. So if you race at thirty-six strokes a minute, and you spend a vast majority of your training time at eighteen strokes a minute, what is the difference in what you're trying to achieve physiologically? And this goes for both recreational as well as competitive rowers. Yep, absolutely. If you're thinking about getting better technically, if you're thinking about improving your physiology, what does it mean to pedal at half speed on a bike? And what are you doing in a single that might be parallel to that? Or and then I can in add, Justin's case. I can add to that with Ted. Psychologically, if somebody does a massive amount of volume at rate 20, 22, um, 20, you know, those low stroke ratings, and then your coach says to you, tomorrow we're doing a 2K, what is the psychological response that people have to that? Yes, Lee, that's exactly it, right? 
How, how many people, you know, they have that moment where they're like, oh my God, like, wh wh what do you mean? And yet that volume is supposed to do everything to prepare you for it. But what swimming and track and field are finding is that developing a psychological comfort with going the speed you need to go so that your body and mind isn't in this constant argument of we shouldn't be going this fast, we shouldn't be doing this, this is too hard, we need to slow down is really important. So I'm, I'm gonna add, a, a, give a, a couple brief little tidbits. So let's just say you are training for a 2000 meter race. A very good rule of thumb is that twice the race distance would be something that you'd want to train at. So if I was training for speed for my race that was 2000 meters long, I would do no more than 4,000 meters of training in that race. If I'm training for a race that's 1000 meters long, I'm not going to do more than 2000 meters. And just and to I interject there. So yep. does that mean none of your pieces would be longer than 4K or 2K, is that what you're saying? No, it means the total volume of work that I'm doing is going to be, is going to be 4,000 meters or 2,000 meters. So and, Justin, just to interrupt again, I'm gonna, uh, sorry if I'm rude, yeah. you can tell me to shut up, but I, I, wanna, I wanna add some things here to layer the, tr the concept here. What, we're, what Justin is suggesting is that as, as this group is a group of masters athletes and there's concern about recovery, physiology, physiology and technical improvements, one of the suggestions that Justin is making is actually reducing volume massively. And I just wanna, I wanna just pause on that for a second. So if you're preparing for the head of the Charles or the head of the Kevin, which might be a 5K race, you're not gonna row more than 10K in a week. That's a, that's a different approach. Well, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't okay. say that. Um, okay. Because the interesting thing about head racing is that that, that is, I, I, when I'm focusing on sprint racing, because a lot of what swimming and track and field is doing is trying to weaponize lactic acid <laughs> um, and trying to develop a lot of a lot of comfort within that state of pain when your body is screaming. So, so we are looking at a massive reduction in volume and a prioritization of recovery and a prioritization of my, I, my body understands how fast I need to go and what it means to be rowing at that cadence effectively at my race pace. So let's just say one session, let's just say we've got a thousand meter race that we're training for. One of the ways that I would look at it is I'd say, well, I know that I can do a 100 meter or a 200 meter level effort. And uh, so it, five 200 meter efforts equal 1000 meters. Does that make sense to everybody? Right? So if I was gonna double that, I would have 10 200 meter efforts. And 200 meters would take somewhere around 40 to 60 seconds. Does that make sense to everybody? And in that place, you're sitting there looking at really intensive output, the, the output that you look to put forward in your race. So let's just say we start and we say, well, I'm going to begin. I'm a long way off. And what I want to do is I want to practice going two minutes for my race pace. I'm just going to put out a real basic thing. Say, I want to go 1,000 meters at two minute split. Does that make sense to everybody? What I would do is I would start and I would do one set of five by 200 meters on with either equal rest or however much rest I need in order to be able to go that speed. Does that make sense to everybody? So it could be much as double rest. So if I say, well, look, it takes me 60 seconds to go 
200 meters uh, at two minute splits. Um, and I'm not feeling super fit right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself two minutes rest in between. And that series would be me doing five by one minute or 200 meters. And then with two, two minutes of rest in between where I would be massively technically focused on how I'm moving and, and making sure my breath was back to me so that my mind and body starts to understand and be comfortable with the speed at which I want to race at. And the idea of not only the technical, listen, my, I understand how to move my body at the stroke rating and with efficiency there, but it's also the mind no longer being in the state of high anxiety, but, but no, starting to say, no, I've done this a bunch. I've got this. 200 meters is now no problem. You know, three, four weeks after doing that workout, you might start to say, wow, I'm getting really, really comfortable with this. And now you're saying, well, maybe I can handle a little bit longer interval, or maybe I can handle a little bit, little bit more rest and not have that anxiety that I feel when I'm in those quote unquote, really, really painful workouts. So Ted, I saw you raise your finger. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple of things that just as a summary here, as we think about this as a concept for training for masters athletes there really are sort of three components to it. There's the technical piece. So what you're saying is our master's athlete can learn a lot by rowing at race pace more frequently and then trying to sustain that through the course of their training. There's also a physi physiological benefit. So the idea being that, and there's ego here, and this is a big idea is that rowing is a very work oriented sport, you know, you yep. grind through your mileage. This approach is quite different, which says when your technical capacity breaks down, you stop, you stop growing because you're no longer performing at this, at the level that you need. So, right. so be kind to yourself. And then to the question in the chat around recovery, recovery becomes a primary driver as opposed to a secondary uh, uh, sort of outcome. And that is what you said earlier, which is the recovery no longer is sort of, you only get 30 seconds off before you do another 500 meter piece, which is what we did 30 years ago when we were kids. Mm -hmm. Now we're, now what you're suggesting is row at the pace that you can race. That is your best. Technically your physiology will follow and don't worry, and, and my words here, so correct me here, which is don't worry about your recovery, but just make sure that you get the volume in of quality work at the highest pace and at the proper physiology. And is that, is that what you're saying or? Yes, in swimming, um, they are able to, the, in swimming and track and field, other watch sports, and, and I saw that Robin wrote, uh, how does this translate to the ERG? And it translates, the pool and the ERG translate very well. When I was down watching um, people who were involved in USA Swimming, hypothetically, let's just say they want, uh, there, there's a young woman and she's swimming 50s and she's trying to make 50s on 28 and she's trying to do a bunch of them. I'm trying to swim 50 yards or 50 meters on 28 seconds. And she's coming to the wall and she's going 27, nine, 27, nine, 28, 27, nine, 28, one, 27, nine, 28, two, 27 or 20, uh, 28, 27, three, 27, one. She's now no longer making that interval. The coaches aren't interested in having her suffer more slowly that the, that is not the speed that is going to help her succeed in her event so what i watched them do is they said well we're taking you down to 25s now and we want you to swim 25s at the pace that you're that you can succeed at and so that your body and your minds know the speed you need to go and you have the rest that you need and it's so interesting because in the pool 
they were making all of these micro adaptations with individual athletes who were tenths of seconds off of where their targets were. And what we know is when you get into an aid, if you're the one who's in there suffering, you just need to suffer along because the crew has to do it as a whole. Um, and that's where, when I looked at Robin's question about how does this translate to the ERG, the ERG can really, you're not being affected by wind, you're not being affected by current, you can be very, very accurate with your training on the ergometer. And, and like we said, it doesn't help you to practice suffering more slowly. This whole glorification of I've suffered more than anyone and hence I deserve it. If you're suffering more than anyone going at a speed that isn't going to help you win, that is not, that is not what you want to be doing with your training. Does, I think that's called that suffering. <laughs> I, and I think that's a little bit of what our, our, our community might be looking for is some of those tidbits around, um, and we have some coaches on this call too. And this is really, this is quite a paradigm shift for a lot of people. So it's, it's as much a, a conversation as anything, but um, we'll get to some of the questions around cross training and strength and mobility in a minute. I'm, I'm definitely, I, I want to ask you about that because that's a big part of the master's rowers experience is yep. that we're not getting on the water every day. Uh, we're certainly not doing uh, the volume that would qualify us to take a strength day or a mobility day. But before we get off that, we're really on sort of a roll here with the idea of part of the enforcement for our sculling community is, is really the idea that when, similar to what you were saying about swimmers, when the quality and the speed drops, a lot of people, I see a lot of people on this call who have speed coaches, it doesn't matter about the wind or it doesn't matter about the current, when the quality of the speed drops below race pace for our athletes, you're suggesting that they simply stop and go into a hyper focus of technical rowing until they can recover enough to go back to full race pace for a duration that they can measure. Is that what you're? And this is where rowing is so hard, upstream, downstream. I know what I'm supposed to do in flat conditions. I know what I'm supposed to do this is why we want to develop the domed rowing space where we can keep the water, like even water temperature. That's our next boathouse. Oh my gosh, water temperature massively influences um, the, 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 the speed with which your hull goes through the water. Um, and you can nerd out on this and a, a ton, but part of it is you start to like, if you do it on your ergometer and you start to feel what that right pace is for you. Um, you can start to translate that feel into the boat. And how many people have heard of being in the flow state or being in the zone in your athletic competitions? Raise your hands if you, if you have. Yeah. So how do they describe time when, when somebody's in a flow state? That's a question to the group. And don't be afraid to speak up. You know, when, oh. when you're in a state of flow, time kind of just, just disappears, really. Um, it just all slow. Like, I can relate it to the car stuff because you don't even know that you're doing what you're doing. Uh, and some, sometimes that becomes a little bit of a dangerous thing. So there's some consciousness there. But, um, but yeah, when, it, when I'm in a state of flow, time just kind of disappears. Yeah. So you're so, Bodhi's describing a sense when he's so immersed in his process that he's unaware of outside factors. Um, and and um, you've also heard pro athletes saying, it feels like time slows down. I feel like I know what pass was going to be made in basketball before the person made it. Um, I feel like uh, I'm a step ahead of all my opponents. And when you're in that incredible flow state in the boat, it feels like you have all the time you need to accomplish everything. There is no angst. There is no anxiety. There is no haste. There is none of that. You're just like, yes, I have all the time that I need to do what I want to do. 
And yet when we train at a massive amount of low volumes and then suddenly try and go fast, it feels like this anxious, panicked, um, uh, never enough time state, which you're so unfamiliar with that, that it becomes uncomfortable, both, both physically and psychologically. So the idea of touching this speed is you want to do, you, a lot of your early speed you want to do where you never get to the point of suffering. You're like, look, I'm going to do 20, 20 second pieces. And maybe I'm doing one every minute and 40 seconds where I'm just working on the alacrity of my hands and the fluidity of my changes of directions. And I want to create a scenario where I suddenly feel like, man, I had all the time that I needed while I was doing that. And the more people you have in the boat, the more challenging it becomes for everybody to hit that feeling of Zen together, that feeling of nine of us were, were absolutely in sync with one another and we were dancing like Barishnikov and it felt phenomenal. So a lot of the early work that you'll do as you work up to speed is you'll give yourself tons of rest. And what you're trying to do is develop an alacrity and a psychological comfort with going there before you try and elongate the distance into what I call the suffering period. And I think, does everybody relate to that kind of goal? The difference between I can do this without suffering and I can do this with suffering or it's going to require suffering. If I'm racing a three minute, a, a thousand meter race and it's gonna take me four minutes. The first minute to 90 seconds, you should be able to do without a ton of suffering. But after 90 seconds in a four minute race, you're going to be suffering. You're going to be dealing with pain. Your body is going to be screaming, stop, 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 stop. And what we want to do is in the early stages of learning how to go fast, work on going fast without suffering. Work on, work on it as a skill component. Work on it as a breath component. Work on it as efficiency a component. Work on it as something that you're just like, I'm looking for that rhythm that speaks to me and, and says, this is the one that I want to carry over the distance of my race. Man, going fast felt easy there. Maybe I only went fast for 40 seconds and my race is four minutes long. But if you hit that right rhythm, then the challenge as we develop is to stretch that rhythm out longer and longer and longer. And we know that eventually when we get into a race, we're going to be asked to hurt in a way that we're not asked to regularly. We're going to be asked to hurt to compete with our competitors, but not every training day needs to be like that. Now, uh, to, to answer one of the things that I want to talk about with Ted is when you go this fast, it takes an incredible toll on your body. And we're looking at usually 48 to 72 hours of recovery when you, if you're going to go out and race twice your race distance or you're gonna go out and go the speed you need to go to win your race for twice, twice the race distance. Imagine if you did two by 2K in a day, how many days rest would you need? Well, the older we get, the more rest that we need. So if I go out and I'm gonna work incredibly hard on Wednesday, and I'm gonna work on going really, really fast on Wednesday, Thursday is going to be an incredibly easy, technically focused day. When I started to break down with my speed, where was the areas that where were the areas that I struggled with? Was I out of time with my entry relative to my change of direction? Was I um, was I suddenly getting incredibly sloppy with my blade out of the water? Were my blades exiting and was I lifting a ton of the river with them and and slowing down the boat? Well, if that's the case, if I look at that and I determine where I was coming apart technically, the next day I am gonna go out and I am going to put all of my energy, not into the physical aspect of going fast, but into the technical aspect of, I'm going to make sure that the next time I do this, I have cleaner, sharper, drier finishes. I have 
much better timing relative to my blade entry versus my change of direction and those things. And then the following day, I can work on some cardiovascular conditions, maybe step up the, the, the effort a little bit more, and then I can look at going fast again um, through there. So I'm seeing a lot of people kind of looking at me, a little bit of nodding, but I'm ready to uh, jump into it. I'm, I'm looking into the, uh, the chat and there are a lot of people saying a lot of really, really good things. Uh, Doug Johnson, yes, HIT is, hit is extremely interesting. Um, you know, high intensity interval training. Um, and with high intensity interval training, uh, it is not the more you do, the better. You want to get the right dose. It's like medicine. Um, I, I look at rowing very much like I, pers I look at doctors. I look at coaches giving workouts like I look at doctors giving medical prescriptions. Not enough is not going to do it. The right amount is going to have exactly the result that you want. And too much is going to be deleterious. Like and, a dose response relationship kind of thing. Oh yes, uh, yeah, exactly. Dose response relationship. Not enough, the right amount, too much. And so many of us have heard so many stories about how much volume somebody. We all feel guilty that we're not working hard enough. We all feel guilty that our opponent is going to be doing a little bit more today than than us. And ultimately, we've got to decide. What is the speed that we want to go in our race? We're going to target that. And if we hit that speed and lose, well, we should still be incredibly proud of ourselves. If we've done what we set out to do with our training and somebody beats us, good for them. Let's come back and adjust our training. Let's come back and say, well, now we know what the, the new speed is. Now I know what I'm going to need to do to beat him or her. Um, I got something for you there. Yeah, yeah. Please. So, so one of the things that uh, we've got some old school rowers on this call who are a little nervous. So I, I call them the volume nervousnesses, right? There are people who still say, this is cool, but what about two things? What about cross training? So where do I put mobility and uh, some form of strength and conditioning in here? And also... So you're seriously telling me I'm going to reduce my volume and I'm going to go faster. And I know those are two questions, but that's one of the themes in the chat here. So I just wanted to, yeah. maybe you could break those up into two different subjects, but, but from the perspective first of how do I fit cross training mobility and strength in this? And then second is, man, you're really making me nervous here because you're telling me to reduce my volume and I'm going to go faster. And then you just said, if I lose, now I've learned. I don't want to lose. Um, awesome. Well, um, basically, all of the research points to once you're north of 35 years old, you're in a state of decline. And thank you so much for saying that. And I the state really, of decline really is not your that. endurance. It is. Oh, sorry, repeat that. The state of decline is not your endurance. Um, the, once we get north of 35, and if you then are 45 or 55 or 65, every decade that advances, strength training and functional, functional movement becomes more and more and more important. Every decade that we go. And I wish we were doing a greater service of teaching our young people and creating the habit of instilling these lessons. When I trained the US junior women, I had this awesome, awesome video um, and it's still available called Yoga for Athletes by Sage Roundtree. She has series for people with tight hips, tight low backs um, uh, that are in there. And then she also has an a la carte menu that you can choose from with various series. And we would train um, and, and our cycle would go like this. We would, we would do um, volume and strength on Monday, technical and volume on Tuesday with a little bit more intensity in the volume that we would do on Tuesday. And then we would go the speed that we would need to go to win our event. At the junior world championships, 
the women's eight would race the Romanians would go 131 to the first 500 meters, which is about the pace that the, that the senior women's eight goes. 131, if you carry it over four, is a 604 2K for women. The Romanians would go insanely fast because what their coaches believe, that is, if we, the Romanian women's eight, can get a length lead on the Americans at the 500 meter mark, the Americans with all of their cars and four televisions in every one of their houses and so much ease of life are so soft that they will never come back on us. We will take their will and we will make it impossible. That length lead, that distance of being able to look back at your opponent and cover every move. So we made it a point of being able to, being able to go not 131 to the 500 because we saw what the Romanians did later in the race they went slowly in the third 500. But I wanted to be close enough to the Romanians at the third 500, in the, at the end of the first 500 that they couldn't relax and they couldn't develop psychological confidence. In the previous years, they had demolished everyone with their lean, long, powerful six foot frames. They stomped everyone to the 500 and they would say, we're gonna win. And my job was to make sure when we got to the 500 meter mark, the Romanians sold their soul in that first 500 meters and they got there and they looked and they were only three seats up on us. They would say, "Uh Oh, this is not how it's supposed to be going. I cannot breathe deeply. I cannot relax my hands while I'm racing here because the Americans are too close. And what I knew is there wasn't a single woman in our crew who had ever gone 132 to the 500 meter mark. They had no idea how. So we had to learn and we had to see that we could do it. So we would very regularly just do 250s. And our job in the 250 was to go 46 seconds. And if we went 46 seconds for 250, you know, you do two of those, it's 132. But the cool thing is usually your second 250 is faster because you're bringing the boat up to speed in the first one. So anytime we were under 47 seconds for our 250, it built our confidence. And we started to say, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, we can go this speed. And we did a whole bunch of work at that speed. And we were very comfortable and very confident that the Romanians were not gonna get away from us. And that when we delivered the Din Mach in the third 500, and the Din Mach means death touch, when we delivered the Din Mach in the third 500, that they were going to be ready to roll over because we had not allowed them to be comfortable like they had been in the past. So we practiced going fast and developing a level of psychological confidence. And we didn't have to do a huge suffer fest to do it. We did it a lot. We did it frequently. We did it well. We did it sharply. We did it over and over and over again. And the women were like, yeah, we can do this. And we can do this without being anxious about it or wondering whether or not we can or having any of those any of that psychological baggage that comes along with the idea like I'm going to do something that my, my mind and my body has never ever done in the past. So that's where that idea of going fast. But the balancing piece to that is you can only go fast when you're recovered and ready to do it. And the older you get, the longer your recovery period. So this whole idea of going fast every day and, and going out there and doing a ton of volume at speed, that doesn't work. That will shatter your body and shatter your spirit very rapidly. You need to balance going fast with then having these sessions that are very easy physically, but very, very mentally challenge, challenging you are going to row the boat with a level of cleanness. You are going to go out there and you're going to row square blades for a hundred strokes without anybody's bottom edge touching the water. You're going to go out there and you are going, and you're going to do pause drills where you're going and pausing at quarter slide, squaring the blades, feathering the blades, and then going and taking strokes without touching the water 10 times in a row. The, you, you take that challenge of the workout and you change it from being physical to being psychological. Is that making sense to people?
Yeah, and just to sort of come back to what you were saying, there really, there are these layers of, of, of training that I think we sort of blow through. Training is primarily physiological, therefore I must wake up and grind. Mm -hmm. What I hear you saying is also there's a level of technical capacity that we tend to focus on at, at quote unquote, what I call drill speed that is never achieved at race pace. And your suggestion is that you actually invert that and you work on technical work at race pace and you see if you can actually achieve it. And then the piece of this, especially for our group is like, where does recovery fall into that? Recovery is an enormous part of success as an athlete. That is probably one of the most underrated facets that I think you bring to this conversation um, on top of the idea that speed is scary, right? Um, strength is scary, speed is scary. Um, <clears throat> and becoming, as you say, sort of the speed that you need to win your event is different than the, um, the level of suffering you bring to the race, to the starting gate. Right? It is yeah. very common. So one of the things about the capitalist society and the American dream is that you've been told that if you show up and you work harder than everyone, you will succeed. That is, the, that is part of the foundation of the American dream. If you show up and you work harder than everyone, you will succeed. And then there is the early sporting culture, um, whether it's the Spurs, Percy Cerruti Stoughton times or how many people um, know of football coaches from way back that just said, we don't drink water during our practices because it's just for soft people. Like we're, we're, we're not going to hydrate. We're, you're not going to drink. That's for people who aren't tough. We are going to, we're going to proceed with our, our football practice, our two hour football practice in 95 degree heat in Texas without any water, because we're tougher than everyone. No, you're stupider than everyone. And, and so this idea that suffering will get you where you want to go. Um, yes, I do not want to pretend that anybody who's racing at a high level, whether it's, whether it's junior or, or senior level or master's level, you are going to need to suffer in your races. Like, um, but because, because your, your competitors are gonna demand that. And we do wanna develop a level of comfort with those moments in the race where you're going to have to suffer. But the idea of constantly stepping into the hurt locker because it's going to make you better at being in the hurt locker is not stepping into the hurt locker and doing a ton of work at 4% slower than the speed you need to go to win your race is going to train you to go 4% slower than you need to go to win your race. And this whole idea of suddenly there's going to be a magical moment when you're rested where everything's going to come together and you've never done this before, but you're going to go this fast. <laughs> that is not how it works. They don't build the rocket and then say, well, you know, you like, it, it, you know, in theory, everything worked out great, but we're going to try and launch it now with a human being in it and send it up there. No, they do all the tests and they make sure that they can do everything that they need to do before they put a human being in there and send it out to space and try and bring it back. And and with you guys, what you want to make sure is that, yes, I have the technical capacity at the race pace, at the rhythm that I want to row my race. Yes, I can easily go the speed that I need to go to win my race for 40 seconds. And then the challenge becomes, how many of those 40 seconders can I link together and how long can I stay physically and psychologically comfortable while doing that? And, and then you get into those race events where it's like, yes, my opponents are going to ask of me more than I normally ask in training. And that's okay. That's what races are all about. Love Does it. That make sense to folks? Wow, that's great. Diamonds so, descending upon us. Huge. Thank if you. I'm a master Thank athlete, you. if I'm advising masters athletes, here's a couple of things that I'm doing. One, um, balancing going fast in speed with strength work 
is incredibly challenging because real heavy strength work requires 48 to 72 hours of recovery, just as real speed work requires 48 to 72 hours. So hypothetically, if we put it at 72 hours and you say, okay, so I lift weights on Monday really heavy and my body's exhausted. And then I try and go fast on Wednesday. And then I lift weights again on Friday. It's going to be incredibly hard to go fast on Saturday. Is that making sense to people? Um, so figuring out how to balance this idea of developing the strength that you need and the functional movement that you need to go fast. You know, if, if an athlete is restricted and she can't reach full slide effectively and easily, she's going to be slowing down the boat with her restrictions as she comes into the catch. And she could speed up by, by eliminating some of those restrictions. So it may be that in November, December, January, the focus is on strength and mobility and developing these capacities to move that are gonna assist you when you then get back in the boat. Then you start moving toward February, March and April, and you're starting to say, now I'm going to do one heavy strength workout a week and I'm going to do two fast rowing sessions a week. And the rest of the time I'm going to be, yes, building my base, yes, cross training, yes, making sure I'm fit enough. But the fittest people do not win the world championships. The fastest people win the world championships. And that is being driven home in COVID through all of the top level swimming coaches. During COVID, volume is really tough for people because they can't get all into the pools and do all of the things. And coaches are finding people are going very, very fast. And they're like, hmm, maybe we don't need to be doing as much. Fascinating. Hey, I just want to give people the opportunity here to sign off or thank, uh, I just want to thank you while everybody's on the call, Justin. Um, I could probably talk to you for another hour about this, but uh, that would be, uh, yeah. talk about a suffer fest. I'm um, reading, uh, I'm reading uh, Ro uh, Rob uh, Ramsdale. Robbins, yeah, Mark Ramsdale. Quentin. Yeah, he's, he's part of the suffer crew. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, you know, we check in. And, and volume, you know, volume is in, in, important. Eventually you need to go. So, so uh, when I talk about going the speed you need to win your event, that is called critical velocity. That is V, capital V. This is the velocity you need to go to win your event. Then there's VT, which is the velocity you need to go for the time you need to go. And fitness does influence that, right? So if you're saying, I need to go two minute splits to win my event, and I can do that really, really well for up to a minute, but my race is four minutes long. And after one minute, I'm slowing down. Well, yes being able to learn how to sustain that speed over a longer distance does require fitness, does require technical capacity, does require mental and physical toughness to accompany it, if that makes sense. That was an action-packed hour right there. This went really fast. Yeah. I see a couple of people who are just like, I got to say, we're going to need to do another one of these because there are a lot of people nodding their heads. And I see a couple injured athletes out there, Christina Baker, you know who you are who have uh, really, really done, uh, who are excellent athletes and who are excellent master's athletes. Too much volume. And maybe, may, I'm not gonna throw stones here, um, but this is an interesting concept for us to consider. And, and one of the things that I like about this conversation is it's got, it's got Bodhi, it's got Christina, it's got, um, you know, Katarina Helmick on there, uh, uh, you know, Lee Warren, we've got a whole breadth of, of experience and, and uh, perspective on the call. And we have our coaches on here too, which is great. Um, well, and Chris I think that- Oh, sorry, I wanted to oh. jump in and talk to Christina specifically. Christina, you don't have to change the amount that you train and work out. Um, you just need to change what you do. And, and I think that one of the things that, that is happening is it's saying the stress that you're putting on your body is exceeding your body's capacity to handle that stress and turn it into something in productive speed. So that tells me that strength and movement. So like you could take a super deep dive into the strength that you accompany through Pilates 
um, or get with, again, Peter Donahoe at an incredible strength and, 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 and not change the amount of time you spend in the gym or spend working on yourself, but tweak, tweak what you're doing with it so that you bring the stress and recovery into balance because that injury is an indication that you're out of balance with your stress and your recovery. That's what injury, sickness, and burnout is. Burnout is an injury to one's motivation. That's what it is. We're picking on Christina, but she can take it. Um, thank you for Christina. Uh, uh, and thank you all for, for joining us. I don't, I don't wanna go too far over. Uh, like I said, we can, we, can go, we can go quite a ways into the night here. Um, but uh, just by way of saying, um, I've copied some of the chat and I'm gonna share that with Justin. Uh, we've got a record of the people on this call. We'll try to get maybe an email out because uh, I think there are a couple really good takeaways um, that include even just the video you talked about, Justin, and some of the resources yeah. you talked about. And I think our, our community really wants to hear from you more. So, um, and, um, I saw that somebody said, tell us about the yoga for athletes. That is sage round, round tree, not round, duh, round with an N, no D round tree yoga for athletes it is a wonderful product and she has three people in the video um herself she is the middle model um then she has an expert that i look at and go you've got to be kidding me and then she has laurens who i love because laurens sucks at yoga and she is so much more like every one of us and Laurence demonstrates all of the modifications that you can make if you are not super flexible and, and how to do it. And I know, Ted, that Sage would be happy to come to CRI and work with people eventually when we all get back opened up. Uh, she's wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. And, and in the meantime, definitely um, uh, part of, part of what, we're, what we're trying to do here is just bring different voices to the conversation and... Uh, and I think that's a great idea uh, for sure. Um, I also want to give a shout out to um, uh, all of us who are not good at yoga, um, but we do have uh, some yoga that's available to us right now. If you haven't already, uh, check out uh, Anna uh, Draschek's, uh yoga program for yoga for rowers from CRI. And I think maybe there's a potential collaboration or some opportunity for us to really put some really neat things together. Um, so uh, with that, um, I feel like I'm cutting this conversation short, but I also want to respect people's time. So yell at me for cutting this off and we'll do another one soon. Thanks everybody. I hope you have a great holiday. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and uh, special thanks to Justin and uh, uh, all that you brought to our conversation. Go Thank CRI, go everybody. Um, Thank we'll you. Look forward to seeing wonderful. everybody on the water. Great, thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Talk yeah. to you soon, everybody. Train well.